as requested by subscribers, we're now going to start looking at the X670 Extreme motherboards. And as you have outlined, and as you have requested, our first motherboard that we're going to start with is going to be the Gigabyte X670 Aorus Extreme Slots and Storage Overview. This is all about content creation and high performance storage. This is not about form, this is all about function. First motherboard, we've got about seven or eight talking points we're going to go through and we're going to do something a little different this time. Because we can take a look at a motherboard block diagram instead of looking at the motherboard as we've done with this one, which is the Gigabyte TRX40 Designator where we have two 16 lane slots and two 8 lane slots. We have a GPU and a two lane slot, not this one, but a different one. And normally, as you can see here, we have Thunderbolt 3 on this motherboard. And those resource allocations are relevant to slots and storage as we look at three different scenarios because as we looked at this motherboard and compared in the past, this time because we have a block diagram, we're going to look at three block diagrams. So we have five pieces of documentation we can look at with this motherboard. We're only going to look at two, which is going to be the motherboard. The other three we're going to look at, or the other three pieces of information we're going to look at, are going to be the block diagram for this Gigabyte X670 Aorus Extreme. Number one. Number two, for this Gigabyte TRX40 Designator, which is in front of me. And number three, which is really we think is the best value, is on the first Gigabyte WRX80 motherboard that has Thunderbolt 3 on it. That motherboard scarce as hen's teeth. And as always we say, whatever your top five requirements are, list those five requirements. Because if you change one thing, that changes everything. And we're going to look at this motherboard first because we have three slots. How they're allocated, though is relevant to slots and storage because of three options of three add-in cards we're going to go through, one of those being a USB 4 card. And because of those slots and allocation of those resources, that's going to affect storage. And how does that affect storage? Good question. So let's keep all this in mind. We're looking at, for this motherboard, for this chipset, as we go one, two, three, consumer desktop motherboard, high-end desktop, workstation. And those are the three levels that we're going to outline to reiterate in that block diagram to show you how that all plays out with resources because it's not everything it's a this or that even though you have all these connectors you can't use all those connectors at one time so of the five or six things we're going to look at the first thing we need to start with and it's really because of the information the way it was laid out some of this stuff is a little bit kind of uh, well there's a lot of obfuscation going on so we're going to start with the motherboard and looking at key features on this motherboard we need to start before we get to specifications and right down here on the page of key features, four key features, and it didn't read it until I read all the way down on the page, right here, this terminology that they're using. Okay, one thing we've already covered and we've talked about, we're going to come back to, is a 20 gigabit USB-C right here, the upcoming gigabyte USB-4 add-in card support. And we need to pay close attention to these add-in cards, of which there are three possible. Because as we talk about slots and storage, yes, it could be PCI Express 3, PCI Express 4, or PCI Express 5. Gigabyte has announced a card. And based on this card that's being talked about, which is a different card, and based on the Gigabyte Aorus Generation 5 add-in card that's been announced. Remember, Gigabyte, about a year ago, announced a card that was PCI Express 4 for eight drives. We think it's based on the high point card. But anyway, to reiterate, that card is only available already with memory on it. When it becomes available, based on what was said in the press release. Now, because that's been a year ago, we expect this card that's uh, talked about on the motherboard page, under features, also will be about a year out. As well as the card we've just outlined, which, which is PCI Express 5, will also be about a year out. So as we're looking at all these things that are possible, we have to plan ahead for these storage options and solutions. And if you're going to configure for it, you have to understand what you can do and what you can't do. So first thing I'm going to do is point this out because it's there. And we're going to come back to that. Another feature on here, this motherboard has 10 gigabit Ethernet, and that's the Marvel or Marvel chipset, however you want to call it. Now let's go look at specifications, keeping in mind this one feature. I'll go back in on USB 4. The wording is different. Because of that, it makes it a little bit tricky trying to find this information. Now we're going to deal with slots and storage as the specs are outlined because we want to reference the specs on the website as well as in the motherboard manual. But first thing we're looking for, for congruent information, because whenever we're trying to outline and look at slots and storage on a motherboard, as you guys ask, what does it take to add it? There's three pieces of information we need. We need the motherboard information, 
then we have to have the uh, CPU and chipset because we have to compare what the design is based on what the implementation is and then put that together. Okay, because we don't have two, we've only got one, which is the motherboard documentation, we're going to have to do some reverse engineering. Now, there's two types of resources we're looking for. We're looking for PCI Express resources on the CPU and PCI Express resources through the chipset. They're different. The only one that matters as it relates to storage is CPU PCI Express lanes. Okay, as it relates to three different add-in cards and the chipset PCI Express lanes come into play when we're talking about these other devices like 10 gigabit Ethernet, whose chipset, how many lanes they use, all that stuff matters. Because when you're dealing with a consumer desktop motherboard, you're dealing with shared resources. When you get to a high-end desktop like this in front of me that we're going to look at in reference, you have dedicated resources. Not enough, but more than what you have here. But where you get into copious amounts of PCI Express resources is when you get into the workstation. And that's why we want to compare, and I'm hoping that image will kind of have that light bulb moment for some of you to go, aha, why am I building here when I could build here, which has been deserted, when I can build here, which is real? What I have to decide is, do I want PCI Express 5 or am I good with PCI Express 4? Do I have to have dual channel or would I rather have to live with 8 channel? Yeah, that's kind of where the options are. But we're going through this stuff because you guys have asked and it's relevant. It's a lot more uh, complicated from our perspective to configure a consumer desktop motherboard because of all these shared resources. It's like stirring a pot. You know, you can't just put everything in there and everything's going to work. You got to put some things in and take some things out. It's, it's give and take. Back to USB 4. You're going to like this. Okay, we'll come back to this. We're going down to past slots and storage because what we want to look at is even past USB. And we've got to look at internal I.O. connectors. And the first three times I looked at this, that information escaped me because I was looking for USB 4. And right there it is. Number 18 on the internal I.O. connectors. That is one THB, which is Thunderbolt underscore U4, which is USB 4 add-in card connector. And that information is the same terminology in the manual. There's nothing in the manual about USB 4. There's nothing in the BIOS manual, which is a generic manual, which kind of, I'll just say, sucks. It's a bummer. Also does not refer to USB 4. There's about 13 different talking points I've got when we get to the BIOS that we'll go through real quick. It's not as bad as it sounds. But there's a lot of things that, uh, some things we like to see, some things we don't like to see, and some things that we're surprised to see, I'll say that. But uh, this terminology, THB underscore U4, is what we're looking for. Now, how is that relevant? Okay, for all the add-in cards that we've been through with Thunderbolt 3, which was pretty generic, got real specific toward the tail end of Thunderbolt 3, but got absolutely specific with Thunderbolt 4. Specifically meaning that Thunderbolt header that connects the Thunderbolt card to the motherboard for BIOS support. Yes, you need BIOS support. Separate topic, different discussion. And I'm not going to get into the jumping pins 3 to 5 on Thunderbolt 3. That's, that's a separate discussion. But that header on the motherboard for Thunderbolt 3 that started out as 5 pins, then went to multiple pins, on Thunderbolt 4 became vendor specific. So if you had a motherboard that supported Thunderbolt 4, you wanted the Thunderbolt card that supported that brand of motherboard for that chipset. And if you had a Thunderbolt 4 motherboard, you couldn't put a Thunderbolt 3 card on it. It had to be Thunderbolt 4. And it went back to that multi-pin header. Okay, why is that relevant right now? On the Gigabyte TRX40, uh, let me back up one. When uh, Gigabyte came out with their Thunderbolt 4 card, they had a 5-pin and a 3-pin header. Okay, with this card on USB 4, based on the documentation in the manual that I'm going to show you when we get to it, to reiterate that point, we've gone back to a 5-pin header. That's relevant have no idea what the driver model is going to look like, but based on some of the settings in the BIOS, you're not going to see anything about Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, or USB 4. You're going to see some stuff about USB, period, that look really, really different. So whatever we show you, take it with a grain of salt, consider the source, because the only thing that matters is what you see in the BIOS. There are some things we can tell you generically you're looking for, but based on what we've read, some of this stuff, from our perspective, is obfuscation, but from the vendor's perspective, this whole thing is changing as we go from USB 3, 10 gigabit, 20 gigabit, now Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, now USB 4. And even on the next motherboard we're going to look at after this, um, there's some issues with how even the 
and I'll be very specific about this, the Intel Thunderbolt 4 chipset is now referred to as the Intel USB 4 chipset. It's the same chipset. They have just put some lipstick on that pig. Anyway, back to the specs. And all this is about clarity. Next thing we need to do up here is go to support and what we're going to be looking for. In fact, while we're here, I'll take a quick look right quick. There should be three BIOS updates that's going to be relevant because of the three things that could be updated. What we're going to see is uh, probably number one, memory compatibility, we do. Number two would be the AGISA code, which we do. Second BIOS update, same. And the third BIOS update, memory compatibility. Okay. The third thing we are going to be seeing in the future, based on experience of previous motherboards, is going to be something to deal with the compatibility of that USB 4 add-in card that's not available, that to reiterate, probably won't be for about a year. But when it does become available, I wouldn't be surprised if there needs to be a motherboard BIOS update for compatibility with that card. And there may be a firmware update based on what we went through with Thunderbolt 3 on add-in cards. So be aware. So we're still talking about three add-in cards we want to do on this motherboard. And right now, we're only emphasizing one add-in card. But while we were here, I want to cover these issues about BIOS and of the three things you're going to be looking for. So if you're looking to build a machine and you never built one, this is an FYI. If you have built and you're not aware of these issues, this is an FYI. And if you're looking to do a comparison of the X670E chipsets, remember, consumer desktop motherboard, shared resources. So you have some options. Specs. And we like options. Okay, BIOS updates. Keep an eye on those. And remember, uh, as we have said in the past, install each one of those consecutively. Because if you look at the BIOS updates right now, these are all the same size. What we don't know and have not seen documentation that says all three of those are updating everything all the time. Until they say that in an ERADA document, step through each BIOS update. F3, F4, F5. Now, while we're at the BIOS and we're talking about that, F5A with gigabyte, when you see that numbering convention, that lowercase a means that is a beta BIOS. So a beta BIOS means FYI, and even though they tell us it's beta, think of it as an alpha. So think twice before you install that. Just keep watching as they update the information, because eventually they'll pull that a, or that lowercase a, with an uppercase, or they'll remove whatever case, because it could go through two or three different iterations. Because a lot of times they do like Microsoft. When they turn something on to fix something, they break something. And depending on what they break, it could be a big deal. So just be aware. And because of another feature that everybody's instituted cause, causing a lot of concern on our standpoint is what they call the encapsulated BIOS updates. And that it, what that means is you're not able to back a BIOS out. So when you update that BIOS, be sure and only update the primary BIOS, which is a benefit of Gigabyte. Don't update the secondary BIOS until you're sure boot BIOS is copacetic. Because if you have any issues with boot, the first thing the vendor is going to tell you to do is what? RMA. And if you've got a system built up and they say pull the motherboard out and RMA it, man, that's a, that's a real bummer. And that's when we get into the smoke test, when people say, oh, that looks terrible. Well, if you've ever had to deal with an issue of a motherboard that's uh, PITA, and you have to unplug everything, you don't want to have to unwire everything. So smoke test stuff just plugged in. We make it look pretty later. I've had to go through that with a lot of people that don't understand smoke tests. Back to the documentation. From the BIOS, now that we've covered that while we're here, let's go over here now to manual support. And we're going to find five different manuals, only two we need, but I'll mention them while we're here for anybody that has not built before. Okay, unique features, you might want to take a look at that. That's number one. Number two would be the BIOS setup guide. We're going to need that. Number three will be the RAID setup guide. If you think you're going to do RAID, we'll talk a little bit about it as it relates to this motherboard, but I'm not going to pull that manual down and get into it. We're going to stick to slots and storage. And then the last manual, which is the main manual, 1001, and that's the motherboard manual. So to reiterate, two manuals that we need. The motherboard manual. We're going to go to page three for the contents and of the five or six things we're looking for. This time we're going to be looking at seven or eight, but we'll go through them pretty quick. Motherboard layout, motherboard block diagram, which is crucial. And for those that are building, we'll take pause on this for just a moment. Two things you need to remember on the boxing, unboxing. Number one, you want to put a camera on your uh, system 
or I should say, on your motherboard unboxing. So what you want to make sure is that you have received what you ordered. There have been some issues with that. Separate topic we'll go into later, but I want to mention it. Number two, what you want to do is inventory your parts, because if anything's missing, what's the vendor going to say? RMA. If you're trying to build and you've got to RMA the motherboard, then you've got some downtime, and then you've got to deal with parts where not everything is available at the same time. Then you've got, you got issues with trying to get it built, get it up, make sure everything is tested and works. Because if something has to be shipped out and shipped back, you're going to lose time. So, number one, put a camera on it, get a video, make sure you received what you've ordered. And number two, be sure and inventory those parts. If there's anything missing that's a deal breaker, you've got to deal with it now. Otherwise, trying to deal with it later, only thing they deal with is RMA. Two points, but important points. The other issue we're going to get into, we may check out back panel connectors. But we're going to be focused on motherboard layout, block diagram, and the product specifications. Those are the uh, three main things we're concentrated on. We're going to be looking for issues of shared bandwidth. And shared bandwidth, when we're talking about slots and storage, is where things get tricky. Remember, there's three slots, three PCI Express slots. How they're configured, we're going to see that as we look at the information. Because of three possible add-in cards we can do that we can't do everything, it also defines how we can use our storage because there are four M.2 connectors on this motherboard. But how you use those depends on the, the, the interrelation with slots and storage. That's why this overview we think is crucial. And to reiterate, we'll take a look at the uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet as we look at the motherboard layout and the block diagram. And to reiterate, as we've touched on RAID, we'll touch a little bit on that. There's, there's some of that in the manual, but not, uh, not as much as what you're going to need. And we'll also, uh, to reiterate, take a look at the uh, 20 gigabit connectors. And those 20 gigabit USB-C connections could be relevant, even if you're using 10 gigabit USB-C, on where they're located. In other words, uh, what lanes are they using? Are they using CPU lanes? Are they using chipset lanes? And which chipset are they on? They on chipset 1 or chipset 2? Because remember, there's two chipsets that make up the X670E. Now, another question comes up. What's the difference when we're talking about the X670E versus the X670? Okay. You get the most resources of everything you want to do as it relates to PCI Express 5 if you're using the X670 Extreme chipset. That's what we're going to be looking at because this gets really interesting. So let's start with the motherboard layout because I think that's a real eye-opener as we peruse around on this surface. Okay, we've got Wi-Fi, USB 2, and that's the Marvel AQC 11 3C chipset, 10 gigabit LAN. And I'm not sure if they're using two lanes or four lanes. That chipset can go either way. And if you've got a motherboard that uses the Intel, that can only use four lanes. Now, that's relevant because as we talk about, again, high-performance storage, if you need 10 gigabit Ethernet, if you need the full bandwidth, and you've got everything done right and you can't figure out why you're getting it, it may be because that's only using two lanes. We'll get to it. But details matter. Four RAM slots to reiterate, dual channel. We're going to go through the specs in a minute. I like to see the layout of the LAN. Okay, four M.2 connectors. One... PCI Express by 16 slot, one PCI Express by 4 slot, and one PCI Express by 2 slot. Now, for somebody who says, okay, those are all three 16-lane slots. Yes, they are, and you're absolutely correct, but those are, 16, those are three 16-lane slots to reiterate mechanically. Electrically, the first one is 16 lanes. Electrically, the second one is four lanes, and electrically, the third one is two lanes. Two lanes, two PCI Express lanes. So you have to think about how many lanes and also now we've got to start looking at, as we get into the details, CPU lanes and chipset lanes. Because when we start having to, uh, and this is something we'll get into the BIOS, what are the requirements, the two primary requirements that we have to have when we want to put an add-in card, whether it's PCI Express 3, PCI Express 4, or PCI Express 5. And yes, Gigabyte's announced the card, and yes, to reiterate, probably a year out. But what are the two requirements? Number one, you have to have a 16-lane slot, which we have, only one of, and it has to be in the BIOS that we'll get to and talk about, full bifurcation. What does bifurcation mean? The ability to fork or to split. So if you have four M.2 NVMe drives, each one, whether it's PCI Express 3, 4, or 5, has to have four lanes. Four times four is 16, full bifurcation. If you get partial bifurcation, you're only going to see a combination of a lesser amount of drives. Now, so the question comes up, if I have four drives on the motherboard, how can I put four more drives on the quad card? Guess what? You can't. What you're going to end up with, and I'll show you how the math works on that, is you would have, if you did four on the quad card, then you would have two on the motherboard. So you're gaining two M.2 drives. M.2 NVMe. Now, another distinction. On this motherboard, and I'll show you the chart when we get to it. This is something we dealt with on this motherboard in front of me. 
And the documentation said one thing, but one of our subscribers said after the experience he saw something else. What was that? Okay. An M.2 connector can be an M.2 NVMe PCI Express drive, or it can be an M.2 SATA 3 drive. What's the big difference? Four lanes versus one lane. Some motherboards on some connectors, it depends, can be either one. And some motherboards on some connectors can reorient or reallocate those resources. Most cannot. They're hardwired. On the motherboard in question that we're talking about, those resources are hardwired. And those resources will only work with the former and not the latter. To reiterate, a PCI Express M.2 NVMe SSD drive. They will not work with an M.2 SATA 3 drive. It is what it is. I'll show you the chart when we get to it. But there's a lot of good stuff in here. It took me a little bit of time to go through this and sort it out. Now, on the motherboard layout, looks like we've got two, four, six SATA ports over here on the right, which is nice. And right there, one little connector, that THB underscore U4. And that looks like a five pin header. One, two, three, four, five. There's another couple of places in the motherboard manual where we'll uh, find that. But that's how it's referred to, THB underscore U4. Nothing about Thunderbolt, nothing about USB until we get to the motherboard BIOS, and nothing about USB 4. Only, only that. That's how it's referred to in this manual. So it's a little bit of obfuscation. Maybe it's uh, got something to do with marketing because of the obfuscation. I don't know. But, you know, clarity would really be nice because we're talking about three add-in cards. I'm only addressing one. And someone's going to be asking about a GPU. That's another one of the add-in cards we're going to address in just a minute. And if you start seeing what's Coming up, hold your, hold your horses. Okay, three slots, 16 lane, four lane, and two lane. Four M.2 drives. Thunderbolt add-in card possible. Now, where do you think and where do you suppose that Thunderbolt card right there for that connection is going to be? It has to be in that four lane slot. And if someone says, why is that? Well, the first slot is a 16 lane slot that uh, is a shared resource we're going to get to. But that second slot is the only four lane slot because that third slot on the bottom is a two lane slot. So if you decide, remember five priorities, what's your number one priority? Do you want a GPU or do you want, and, and yes, you could use the internal GPU, we're gonna address that, or you could use the quad card, PCI Express 3, 4, 5, when it finally comes out. Or do you want the Thunderbolt, well, excuse me, I say Thunderbolt, or do you want number three, the USB fork add-in card, that's probably about a year out before it comes out. Probably going to be using the AS Media chipset because it doesn't say anything about Intel. Anything with Intel referring to a chipset is going to be Thunderbolt, unless because I've seen now with marketing where their Intel is now calling their Thunderbolt 4 chip a USB 4 chip. It's just to reiterate lipstick. So there's going to be some obfuscation, and we're going to have to really pay attention to the details as it relates to the chipset. Now, USB 4 is going to have two versions. This is important going forward. Right now, we're getting ready to implement USB 4. Version 1 or Revision 1, which states PCI Express 3.0, four lanes. When we go to implement Version or Revision 2, it's going to be PCI Express 4, four lanes. It's the difference in PCI Express 3, four lanes, versus PCI Express 4, four lanes. A lot of difference in bandwidth. Uh, right now with Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, and USB 4, it's going to be a 40 gigabit bandwidth both ways. It's bi-directional. However, when we get to USB 4 Version 1, because of the bi-direction capability on PCI Express 3 with four lanes, they're supposed to be able to kick that up. I have no idea. Uh, has must, must have something to do with that bi-directional to 65 gigabits. Now, yes, PCI Express 3, four lanes, is only good for about 32 gigabits. And as we talk about throughput, that's burst mode. That's not actual bandwidth. So... You know, you're talking about some smoke and mirrors to get that up to 65 gigabits. And with the uh, version 2 of USB 4, that's supposed to be able to go up to 80 gigabits. That'll be some more of that smoke and mirrors. But I, I want you to be aware of the numbers and the requirements because right now, we're just getting started. And I find this, to reiterate, absolutely fascinating. Across the uh, bottom, we've got our usual where we have a couple of uh, USB 3 connectors. It'll give us uh, two ports on each one of these connectors down here on the bottom. And we've got our USB 2 connections, which are across the bottom. But we also have, which will get us to the front of the case, but we also have on the back, on the I.O. panel, some more ports. And as we look here, we have an AMD chipset number one and AMD chipset number two. And those two chipsets comprise the totality of the X670 Extreme chipset. 
So we're going to have so many lanes in this chipset and so many lanes in this chipset. This chipset is connected to that chipset, and this chipset is connected to the CPU through lanes from the CPU. So we've got to figure out all these lanes and what we've got with this chipset and this chipset and what USB-C ports for 20 gigabit are connected to each one of these chipsets. And the reason I think this is relevant is anybody that's looking to build a machine like this, and again, it's a consumer desktop motherboard with shared resources. If you want to install this as a DAW for a digital audio workstation, which interface are you going to use? And what's the number one requirement for a digital audio workforce interface? For a digital audio workstation workforce, you want something with low latency. Okay. So to reiterate, which chipset do you want to be on? I would think if four lanes connect chipset two to chipset one, if there's something connected to chipset number two, it's going to be higher latency than something connected to chipset number one that connects directly to the CPU. I don't know that for a fact, but that's my theory and that's my opinion until I see more information. As it relates to this Gigabyte TRX40 designator, where we have one you cannot see under a heat sink, and number two under a heat sink, where we have two M.2 NVMe PCI Express drives direct to the CPU, and the other two are underneath this long heat sink right here, and those two are through the chipset. There's a little bit of a difference in the speed of those four M.2 drives. Now, M.2 drives, as far as speed, matter greatly if you're dealing with a digital audio workstation for virtual instruments. You want that stuff to load quickly. And if you're looking at using one of these machines like we're talking about for rendering, keep in mind it's a consumer desktop motherboard. You're topping out at 16 cores. So a formula that we use that comes into play, we don't use Adobe software, but the Adobe formula for the Adobe After Effects multi-frame rendering, CPU optimization, two things that are stated. Number one, CPU core count times four equals RAM. So if you say you've got uh, 16 CPU cores and you're talking 64 gigs of RAM, pretty good. Okay, number two. CPU cores, which would be 16 cores, as much, much as you can go with, you're looking at uh, CPU cores equals video RAM. So if you've got 16 CPU cores, you want a GPU with 16 gigs of video RAM. That's the formula for a purpose-built generalized machine as a minimum for those specs. If you want more CPU cores, then you're looking at something like the high-end desktop. If the high-end desktop, take a look at the price of the motherboard and the price of the CPU doesn't work, you're looking at a workstation. And the workstation and the high-end desktop were pretty equal on CPU cores. Where they changed and where the workstation excelled was eight-channel memory, eight channels of PCI Express lanes that connected the chipset to the CPU, and also you had lots of PCI Express lanes that can be bifurcated to put in lots of stuff. So the difference going from here to here was okay. Going from here to here was okay. But the difference in going from down here to up here is tremendous. But once you understand these resources, all this starts to make sense. And then you're going like, uh, it's something you never saw, but now that you see it, you can't unsee it. And it's kind of annoying when you realize the obfuscation of what's going on. Now, this is a lot simpler on the AMD platform than what we've seen on the Intel platform for trying to go with PCI Express 5 and how all this soup fits. We got more. And the goal is, again, to simplify. So again, we've looked at reiterate two chipsets. We looked at our USB ports. Now from the motherboard, let's go look at the uh, motherboard block diagram. And this is where things really start coming into play. Okay, we have a CPU. We have lanes we're going to look at. We have two chipsets we've talked about. And we want to see what's on those two chipsets. Chipset 1 and chipset 2. Now the other documentation to reiterate that we do not have that we need is we're going to have to reverse engineer this and figure out what our lanes are. Number 1 are CPU lanes. CPU lanes are relevant as we look at and I'll go back on the motherboard layout because remember, and we'll reference this and reiterate this several times, we have four M.2 connectors on this motherboard and we have one 16 lane slot, one and only one. On the motherboard block diagram, just to the CPU, here on the left, PCI Express 5.0 bus, and this to reiterate is the big advantage of this chipset. First in line, we have two dedicated M.2 NVMe drives. That's M2A underscore CPU and M2D underscore CPU. The other two, M2B and M2C, are on a switch. That's four lanes and four lanes. Okay, right there is eight lanes dedicated, four lanes for each drive. On this switch, this can be a 16 lane slot, which we've talked about, or if you want to use these two M.2 drives that are on this switch, then that 16 lane slot becomes an eight lane slot. 
which is kind of a bummer when you think about it because what you really need or what we need on this chipset are double the amount of lanes that we've got that we don't have, and that's the purpose of the high-end desktop, which has gone flat. And that's why you have to leap over it, and that's why we're going to take a look at these other block diagrams because I'm hoping this view will help more than this view of this motherboard as we talked about slots and lane assignments. That's why having this is extremely helpful. So we can do a quick lane count and kind of reverse engineer what we've got. And of the documentation we've come across about the uh, Ryzen 7000 CPUs, uh, two things we don't know is how the memory controller is configured, if they're going to have the same problem we had on the 5000 series processor, which as long as you used dual channel RAM, two channels, two sticks, you were fine. When you went to four sticks, you had a performance hit. We don't know if that problem has been solved on this CPU. The other issue is because since we don't have enough CPU PCI Express lanes, how are we going to allocate those resources? They're not infinite. It's shared. And we have to consider, again, list your five priorities. We're talking three add-in cards. What's the priority on that CPU for that chipset on that motherboard? And to reiterate, the CPU lanes, that's eight and that's 16. So if we say 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Now, if somebody says that's 24 lanes, well, it is to that point, but we got more stuff we got to count because um, we're going to get that count up to probably about 32, fuzzy math, but we'll get pretty close and I'll show you. So to reiterate, if we're 24 with just these resources on this side, what else do we have? Okay, looking here on the right side, our DDR5 memory right here, USB-C generation uh, 2, which means that's a 10 gigabit port. Then we have some uh, USB 3 ports, and we've got some USB 2 ports, which is out the back to the CPU. Okay, that's probably total of all that, about four lanes, I'm guessing. Uh, for example, that could be two lanes, and with USB 2 and USB 4, I'll just say in rough numbers, that's four lanes. So if you've got 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, that's 25, 26, 27, 28. Now then, what else do we have? If the CPU is connected to the chipset through four lanes. That's 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. So by my math, real quickly, this tells me we have 32 CPU PCI Express lanes because the CPU is connected to that first chipset that are downgraded to PCI Express 4 for that chipset. So four lanes go to the first chipset and then four more PCI Express lanes tie that second chipset to the first chipset. And anything on this second chipset has to go through those four lanes to get to this chipset to go to the CPU, which is PCI Express 5 reiterated lanes downgraded to PCI Express 4. That's my understanding. We need 32 lanes just to do what we're doing. And we really need another 16 lanes on that CPU that we don't have. There's no BIOS update that's going to make it work. It ain't there. It ain't going to happen. So that's one option. The add-in card that has to be bifurcated that requires a 16 lane slot. If you put that in there, what do you do with the GPU? This is scenario one. Because of the issue, let's take a look at that again. On the motherboard, with this slot being the second slot to reiterate, being a four lane slot, you'd have to put your GPU in that four lane slot. And if we put the GPU to reiterate in that four lane slot, then that third add-in card cannot be installed in that computer. Doesn't come with it, has to be purchased separately. Not available yet, about a year away. So what do we do about video. Okay, for option number two, if your first option is that 16 lane slot for a quad add-in card to get you four M.2 drives, which means that secondary resource, because it's shared, is going to be two M.2 drives, which gives you instead of four drives on the motherboard, two on the motherboard, four on the quad card, six drives. Then your second option for video is going to have to be video out of the CPU. Based on the numbers that we're going to get to, that is going to be using a DDR memory can be anywhere from, I believe, 64 megs to 16 gigs. Now, based on the Adobe formula, for the CPU cores, number two, CPU core count equals video RAM. If you've got a 16 core CPU and you got 16 gigs of video RAM, which is DDR5 memory allocated to that, then what I would want to try to do, if possible, is to get more memory on the motherboard, which is part of formula number one, because 16 CPU cores times four equals RAM, which would be 64 gigs, I'd want to try to go more RAM. But my concern is, can you get RAM dense enough to go beyond 64 gigs without using those other sticks? But we don't know the relevancy of 
the memory controller on the CPU yet. Don't have any idea. Someone's going to have to find out. So all these things are a state of play that we're trying to figure out. But this is a good example because it's more complicated on a consumer desktop motherboard to configure all this because of these shared resources. What affects this? And when you give and take, what do you actually gain? So number one, we've looked at, for slots, an add-in card. Number two, we've talked about the GPU, which really needs to be in that slot if you're going to use it. And if you're using this for rendering, the GPU can be up to 80% of the rendering. Based on the spacing, it looks like you're going to be good for just about anything. And based on some of the stuff we're seeing on the spacing of that, consumer desktop motherboard, consumer GPU, whatever you get. I've seen stuff where uh, Lenovo is coming out with one that's up to four slots wide. And that looks like that's just about what that's going to be. And then you still got to deal with your power supply, enough power to run all that. Because you don't want those little glitches because clean power is everything, especially when you're dealing with RAM on this new spec. You want a good clean power. So uh, if you install the GPU, yeah. If you install the GPU on that, you're only going to get two M.2 drives. If you uh, want four drives, then that 16-lane slot becomes an 8-lane slot. Shouldn't be an issue, but be aware. And that's probably the best of both worlds, accepting the fact for scenario number two that for that slot, you're going to use a separate GPU because the GPU can do 80% of the rendering, depending on your render engine, to install that GPU, which would be in an 8-lane slot if you use not two but four M.2 drives. You have to decide your resource management. And right now, that's the only shared, which is pretty wild, resource. When we get into the uh, stuff on the chipsets, chipsets one and two, that's all dedicated. The question is, how many lanes? We'll, we'll figure that out. It's uh, more than I realize, but, you know, again, it's never enough. But that's the big issue. Now, your add-in card number three. If you put a GPU in there, and you accept the fact that it's in a 16-lane slot with two M.2 drives, or it's in an 8-lane slot with four M.2 drives, because remember, each M.2 drive has to have four lanes, or else you're not going to get the full bandwidth. And uh, that's pretty wicked when you think about it, based on the speed you're going to get. We expect there's probably going to be three generations, or three iterations, of PCI Express 5 drives. 10,000, what number two will be, somewhere in between. But it'll, it'll take time to ramp up. And that's another way to feed that stuff to us spoonful at a time until we get it where we want it. Built-in obsolescence. So you have to decide what's more important to you. Dedicated resources or shared resources. And if you build this machine, I would put this at about a two or three year machine because based on shared resources, you're going to want to do more later. So scenario number three would be going with scenario two for the GPU so that you can also then eventually add USB 4 on that motherboard. Now, this next motherboard we're going to look at has an Intel Thunderbolt chipset in it, defined as USB 4, which means it's the Maple Ridge Thunderbolt 4 with some lipstick on it, now that they've updated the information. Um, but it's built onto the board, so we have to, again, look at resource allocations. But as we look at this with what we can do as it relates to slots and storage, that would work. Now, what would you put in that third slot that's only two lanes? Well, if you put a capture card in, and there's better ways to do capture, uh, either through USB-C or for high performance storage, the 20 gigabit, or when this becomes available, the 40 or 65 gigabit through the USB 4. But initially, through the 20 gigabit connection or anything, let's just say externally. Blackmagic has some stuff that'll blow the doors off of anything you can put in a computer. But your capture cards would either be, uh, they'll all be PCI Express 2, if you didn't know, but they'll use one lane or two lanes. And if you're using a 4K capture card, Internally, that's where you put something on a slot like that. As far as an I.O. card, any I.O. card that we're aware of that's going to be a USB-C 20 gigabit is going to have to have four lanes. Any other add-in card that's going to provide more benefit, even a, uh, and, we, and we found one since some of you guys have been talking about it and asking, we found a 20 gigabit USB-C card that has two 20 gigabit ports because it has two chipsets and it takes eight lanes. So it wouldn't work on this motherboard. So what else would you put in a two-lane slot? That's a good question. I don't know. Capture card's first thing comes to my mind. But to reiterate, I think you're better off with an external device. So what else we got? There's a chart I wanted to show you that deals with the uh, lane allocations and what works and what doesn't work. And I'm going to do a search for this based on M2A because now we need to look in the specs. This takes us to the chipset, which we've still got to go through just to be safe. We've got our six SATA ports. Each SATA port is one PCI Express line through the chipset. 
but we still need to find that chart which doesn't show shared bandwidth and right here this is on page 27 this is uh, right below the documentation it talks about the connectors and if you notice they're using a new type of fastener where we don't have to uh, remove the screw which is about time because those little screws get tedious so on this chart on page 27 this is the type of M.2 SSD supported by each M.2 connector M2 A, D, C, and B to reiterate M.2 PCI Express by 4 M.2 PCI Express by 2 which would be two lanes and it does not support an M.2 SATA SSD to reiterate that point only M.2 now I'm not aware of anybody using an M.2 NVMe with two lanes that was an option that goes back to the 990 FX chipset when we went through I think it was the uh, second revision or reiteration of that motherboard when the first change they made was to take away a couple of SATA ports which was kind of a bummer because SATA was a big deal nine years ago reallocated that to give us two lanes for NVMe support okay PCI Express 3.0 3500 megabytes was wicked but because we only had two lanes instead of four chipset limitation without losing more SATA ports which we couldn't it gave us four SATA ports instead of six we would get two lanes which gave us 1750 megabytes per second at that time based on the price of the drives we opted for the less expensive M.2 SSDs even though they were only 600 megabytes because they were SATA a SATA M.2 SSD was still faster than a spinning drive so it was price performance but now going forward and something else I realized this issue with bifurcation still got the manual to go through uh, when that came into play was with PCI Express 3 but I didn't realize to looking back that actually became an issue again on the same chipset when ASUS came out with a motherboard with PLX chips that provided that capability for PCI Express 3 on that chipset for those processors on those motherboards a wicked option but we didn't realize it was an issue until the X299 chipset came out and all that stuff with VROC and RAID and everything okay now since I've mentioned RAID as we're talking about these four drives let's take a look what will that motherboard support okay we're talking AMD RAID which will support RAID 0 RAID 1 RAID 10 and it doesn't say it but it may be enabled through a BIOS update later I've never seen it in the documentation but I've seen it in the motherboard on this gigabyte TRX 40 designare which is RAID 5 and the advantage of RAID 5 that AMD says we can't use is the ability to hot swap but hot swap is a feature of the motherboard in the BIOS that we'll get to that's there okay what are the requirements for RAID 0 or RAID 1 two or more drives so we have four connectors if you use only two drives you could raid those two to the CPU if you use four drives you could raid all four of those drives to the CPU raid zero benefit raid zero is what I call raid by the seat of your pants which gives you speed and capacity if you want redundancy raid one and if you want a combination of raid zero and raid one which is one zero then you get both worlds but everybody always asks about RAID 0 so that's what we show that's what we've shown on all the quad cards the six drive cards all that stuff get a lot of questions about how to do AMD RAID and how to do Intel RAID it's uh wow anyway another video I digress so to reiterate you can do RAID and it's a good option for this motherboard if you choose but remember this is PCI Express 5 man that's that's wicked fast and eventually you're going to get one that'll be up to 15,000 megabytes eventually probably about a year or so out that speed will improve so you have to think about it PCI Express 3 was 3500 megabytes per second PCI Express 4 we had three different iterations started out at 5000 megabytes then it went up to 7000 then a little over 7000 megabytes per second for a third generation PCI Express 4 drive so when you go from 7000 megabytes read and write and you're looking at 10,000 megabytes on the read and the write for a version 5 drive when you get your hands on one that's pretty wicked for one drive so uh, I think RAID for most people is more of an anomaly than it is a necessity but it's just my opinion based on my experience some of you would ask for us to do something about RAID for a be basic beginners guide I'm thinking about it because uh, RAID's been around a long time and so have I and I might share that experience in another video to give you some background but to reiterate you can do it on this board it's feasible if, if you want it's one of those things been there done that so now we need to take a look at the motherboard manual I think we've laid out the situation for three different add-in cards and you get an idea 
of how this hodgepodge of shared resources works. It's going to be the same issue on every consumer desktop motherboard, but the resource allocations are going to be different because they change how they, how they do stuff. You may have a motherboard that's got two 16-lane uh, slots mechanically, but the two slots used simultaneously are both eight-lane slots. Remember, you're talking about a 16-core CPU. There's nothing you can do about that. It's etched in stone. Let's look at the BIOS. I've got 13 points to go through real quick of, to reiterate things we liked, things we didn't like, and things we were surprised to see. And this is the part that kind of got me. This is a BIOS setup manual for the AMD 670B650. And remember, two of those B650 chipsets make up the X670 or slash X670 Extreme chipset. And the big difference in the uh, X670 and X670 Extreme PCI Express 5. First thing we're going to look for is bifurcation. And everybody calls it something different, but fortunately Gigabyte calls it what it is. And this is on page 15, and I did search the document, for PCI Express by 16 bifurcation. Allows you to determine the bandwidth for PCI Express by 16 slot is divided. Options, auto, 8 by 8 and if the configuration were shown 8x8, what does that mean? That means you're going to see two drives. That would be in position 1 and 3, because remember, we need 4x4. Four four. Next, which would be a partial bifurcation. And this also is partial, and that one is 8x4x4. By four by four. And what does that configuration mean? Okay, that configuration means you're going to see drive number 1, and then drive number 3 and 4. That means you're not going to see drive number 2. It's a partial bifurcation, and know those slots for those lanes. If you're not using them, you're not using them. There's no way to reallocate them. Has to be done in the BIOS. And the auto mode, of course, is full 16 lanes, not bifurcated. Now, ASUS calls it something different. And depending on what generation of the product they're working with, they'll call it something different. But it, it'll go by several different names. Bifurcation, which is what it is. Or 4x4x4x4, four by four by four by four, which is full bifurcation, which is what this needs to run a quad card. Whether it's PCI Express 3, 4, or 5, lane allocation is still the same. 4x4x4x4, four by four by four by four. and that's the requirement for the quad card that's not out yet that's probably a year away, if that. But it's exciting to know it's, again, something in the works. Uh, I need to interject. That card is going to have, I believe, eight sensors on it, which means there'll be one sensor on the controller for each M.2 drive and one sensor on the memory. So each drive will have two sensors, total of eight. What I don't like, and this is something that points back into the BIOS, is you're going to have to install the bloatware to be able to read those. Brings up another point I'm going to get to in here that uh, one of the things I didn't like in this BIOS, but this is something that ASUS is doing. I'll get to it. I want to tell you now about the things that uh, I don't like that I don't see. And I'm going to show you my list. Number two through five, no tunneling, which would be PCI Express tunneling over USB 4, no Thunderbolt, no display alternate mode, which is DP alt mode, and no USB 4. And this little guy here, the Gigabyte Utilities Downloader Configuration. I'm going to show you that information. Would you believe that's in the BIOS? I'm going to search that ter terminology, and that is on page 15. And yes, that's a configuration in the BIOS. Now, that's one of those things that I don't like. And that's one of those things that ASUS is also doing, a setting in the BIOS. First of all, whatever operating system you install, with the uh, expectation you're going to install Windows, they're going to install this stub application, which is another application in your operating system, that you're going to be trying to figure out how to uninstall that when there's no uninstall routine. That's a setting from the BIOS. Turn it off if you can. I don't like any extemporaneous software, and I don't like a vendor pushing something on us that we may not want. And that's one of them. Um, I'm okay if it's something I choose, but I want to be the one to choose it, not them. So I would turn this off so I don't get that extemporaneous software if I want to. Because a lot of times when you're building a machine, you need to build it simple. And I've seen too many people build up a machine, and then they're trying to figure out what's wrong. Well, the only way you can diagnose a machine is you've got to build the layers, which you start with the motherboard, your CPU, and your RAM. Then you drop in a GPU. That's it. And then you see how that works. Go through some BIOS updates. Then you add the next component. We got into that, and we've got several videos how it related to Thunderbolt 3, where we had a bus, what I call a bus prioritization issue with the GPU and with Thunderbolt, which required two things, a firmware update for Thunderbolt and then a motherboard BIOS in that order. Crazy stuff. But when you, when you try to build up a machine and you add something like this, you're just adding layers upon what's wrong. Something like that could cause a BSOD if there's an issue with the driver. Uh, so I'm just saying beware and know how to solve that. Now, to reiterate, ASUS has done the same thing on their WRX80 workstation motherboard. Why? They didn't ask us. But that's one of those things I don't like. And I had to point that out. Okay, because this is a generic manual, 
there's a super I.O. configuration serial port. We don't need to look. We can see on the motherboard that there's an I.O. chip. Uh, normally, the I.O. chip does a lot of the mundane activities. Won't get into that. But there is not a serial port on this motherboard. I'm kind of surprised, but this is a generic manual. So it's something to uh, be aware of on other iterations of that motherboard. They're going to have a serial port. I was surprised to see that. I thought we did away with that a long time ago. Now, here's the stuff that really surprised me. Because we don't see anything about Thunderbolt, and we don't see anything about USB 4, now we've got configurations in the BIOS, and I'll show you. USB configuration, USB mass storage driver support, and then mass storage devices. And then, of course, my favorite down here, hot plug. Let's go look for USB configuration. And that happens to be on page 15. Legacy USB support, right here. USB mass storage driver support. Enables disable support for mass storage devices. And then down here, mass storage devices. Displays a list of connected USB mass storage devices. The item only appears when a USB storage device is installed. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I think that's probably going to have something to do with USB 4, which means they're changing some of the uh, information for the nomenclature, which to me is a bit confusing. But, but I get that. But it took me quite a while looking through this because the terms I expected to see I could not find. So of the things we've mentioned that some of you guys have looked for, number one, PCI Express tunneling over USB 4, I can't find it. Anything about Thunderbolt, I can't find it based on those terms. And then number three, which is of the three things that we're going to see from now on with USB-C going forward, number one data, number two power delivery, but number three, if it's enabled, and the vendors will tell us, would be display port alternate mode, which allows you to have another monitor plugged in. Couldn't find that either, which because it's USB 4 should be in there, but if it's not in the motherboard BIOS, it's got something to do with that card, which is a menu that wouldn't be activated until that's plugged in. So because this is a generic BIOS and not a specific BIOS, I'm telling you what you're looking for, but I'm telling you what you're going to see based on the information they've provided. And all this, of course, is going to be a state in play because this is very preliminary. And of course, the integrated graphics, that has to be addressed. And the options for integrated graphics to auto, force, or disable. And the other is, of course, setting the aperture for it. And right here under the UMA frame buffer size, this item is only present when you install a CPU that supports this feature. In other words, to reiterate, I'm going to go back through the specs real quickly. But if you've got a CPU that has video on board, and if you allocate, because you have a 16-core CPU, if you allocate 16 uh, gigabytes of video RAM to it, that's the setting you want to address. Otherwise, the default will be uh, just enough to get that thing up, up and running. But your CPU has to support it. And I don't care for that kind of video. And I'm curious if it can do any kind of rendering. I'm doubtful, but I don't know. And another one I was surprised to see was SPD Info. That's Serial Presence Detect, and that deals with the memory. That should have been in the BIOS a long time ago. SPD Info displays information on the installed memory. Okay, when we install memory, whichever profile we're going to be using, memory reads that SPD, the Serial Presence Detect chip, which is programmed, that says this memory can do this. So when you go to beyond whatever the JDEC spec is to overclock your memory, more than likely, if you're doing a default setting, it's reading that chip that's been programmed that, yes, can be reprogrammed. So you want to stick with memory that's on the QVL. With DDR5, what we know right now is AMD is fully committed to DDR5 on this platform. So uh, it's nice to have that instead of having to use that separate application to read that. We can read it from the BIOS. Nice. Now let's go back to the specifications on the motherboard page. AMD Ryzen 7000. There's a support list we can check out. The X670 chipset, actually the X670 Extreme. As far as memory modules go, this will support up to a 32 gig DIMM, so that would get us 64 gigs on two sticks. It'll go up to DDR5, 5200, and it's uh, non-ECC. So we've had a question come up before about ECC versus non-ECC. And to reiterate, it'll support the AMD Expo as well as the XMP profiles. If the memory supports it, the BIOS will support it. And refer to the memory uh, QVL for the correct memory. Okay. Integrated graphics, we've covered that. Two options, two ways to go. The resolution you can get up to with one display port or the resolution you can get up to with one HDMI. You're going to get a higher resolution, which would be the uh, 4096 by 2160 at 60 hertz if you're on HDMI. And that's HDMI 2.0. Uses a Realtek audio codec, the ESS digital audio chip. But if you're going to be using this for a digital audio workstation, that's a consideration that you're probably going to want to consider for a different audio interface.
whether you use something on USB or whether you use something uh, USB-C. And uh, this question is also going to start coming up because if you're, if you're looking at this motherboard because you want to use it for USB 4, Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, that's about a year out before you're going to see support. So you want to find something else or find a different motherboard or find a different audio interface if you're looking. I think a lot of people, a lot of times, first of all, should be looking at a pro audio interface based on latency for the mics. But I think a lot of times people choose an audio interface based on popularity. So stick with the specs, first of all. Get something that meets your needs. But you don't have to get something whiz-bang unless it does what you want. And another thing I'd look for on a pro audio interface, number one, low latency. But number two, I wouldn't get anything bus power. If you ever had to chase down those gremlins or where that noise is coming from, you want that power coming through a wall wart instead of through the bus. That's just my experience. Take it for a grain of salt. The third thing you may deal with would be, uh, and for this you'll want to turn off your Wi-Fi, but if you get into a uh, DPC latency issue for the Pro Audio, it's because Windows is not a real-time operating system. It's doing this real, real fast. But because it's doing this real, real fast, it's looking at everything and polling everything. And the Wi-Fi, it keeps looking at and polling to say, are you there, are you there, are you there? And it's like, yeah, dude, I'm here. Turn that off and it'll stop looking at it. Simple as that. So those are three issues to think about for a Pro Audio interface if you're looking for this motherboard. And really on any motherboard for that matter. Okay, we have the Marvel or Marvel ACQ 113C chipset 10 gigabit. Let's go back over to the motherboard, our two chipsets. Let's go back to our motherboard block diagram. Because all we've done is looked at this one block diagram that I still want to look at the other two and compare. But let's get down here into the chipset. Okay, four lanes that connect chipset one to the CPU. Now, chipset one is PCI Express 4.0. Got that? One PCI Express by four slot. But all we really need for the add-in card we're talking about is PCI Express 3, but this is what we've got. Four lanes. We have four SATA ports. That's four lanes. One lane per SATA port. So that's eight lanes we've allocated. And then we have uh, right here, USB-C generation 2x2. Two two. The generation 2x2, two two, that's our 20 gigabit USB-C. So if I'm putting a Pro Audio interface on here, if I have to have 20 gigabit, which you probably won't, but if it did, that's where I'd put it. If I can live with just uh, USB-C 10 gigabit, I put it on the connection that goes to the CPU. It's going to be the fastest, lowest latency. I'm just saying. And then the third one is going to be down in the other chipset, which I think will be the highest, highest latency, which for an audio interface, I think would be an issue. Connecting storage, I don't think you'll have a problem. But it's just good to know where the plumbing's at. Okay, how many lanes do we have? Based on what we know to be true, there should be 16 lanes per each chipset. So 4 and 4 is 8, which puts us at 4 lanes for USB-C, 4, 8, and then that's 8 more lanes for these other ports. That would be 16 lanes. And what I have read that says the first chipset has 8 usable lanes, and those are all hardwired. None of that's shared. So let's go down real quick now to the second chipset that uses 4 lanes. And remember, this first chipset... These four lanes coming down from the CPU are CPU lanes downgraded to chipset speeds. Now, to reiterate, PCI Express 4. Chipset number two, or if you want to call it, the South Bridge. This is PCI Express 3. PCI Express 3 is all we need for the USB 4 add-in card. However, that's only a two-lane slot, so it's PCI Express 3, two lanes. Which, if you, to reiterate, put in a uh, capture card, that would be one lane or two lanes. It'll be PCI Express 2.0. It'll work. So anyway, there's two lanes, and there's two lanes for two SATA ports. So we have four SATA ports on chipset number one, and two SATA ports on chipset number two. Probably a little bit of latency. Doubt you'll know it, because those are 600 megabytes for an SSD, burst mode. And if you're using uh, just a straight SATA drive, you get whatever you get. Now, this shows Wi-Fi using one lane, and this right here shows the Marvel 10 gigabit using two lanes. I had to do some digging on that because I didn't believe what I was seeing, and it is. According to the Marvel chipset, and I can bring up the invitation in the description, I won't show you here, but suffice to say, 10 gigabit is on PCI Express 4, but that 10 gigabit on PCI Express 4 is using two lanes. If this were the Intel chipset, originally it could support two lanes. That's been removed in the errata documents, and it only uses four lanes. So if I have a preference on the chipset that I want to use for 10 gigabit, because 10 gigabit would be a priority, I want it on four lanes, and those four lanes is going to be the Intel chipset. Uh, so all these little things matter, but this works with two lanes, and that's what they've allocated. So what's our lane count? 
We have never taken the time to do a full lane count on any of the chipsets. I always consider that going in the weeds. But since we're kind of having to reverse engineer this, to the left, two lanes, plus two lanes is four, plus one, plus two. So that's seven lanes. And then we have uh, these SATA ports down here, USB uh, 3.2, so that'd be 10 gigabit. So the one port that uses four lanes is that 20 gigabit USB-C port. So that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 which means those four ports would be using one lane. So that would be 12. Now, consider the source. Take it with a grain of salt. That's what I get out of looking at those lanes and how those resources are allocated. It's something to think about, about what you're going to plug in, what you're going to get, what you're going to have to take. I find these motherboards absolutely fascinating because resource allocations are just amazing with the give and take. Now, one other thing I want to show you in the BIOS that's a big deal to me. We uh, had this and have had hot plug for a long time. Hot plug originally came about with a RAID, and it was separated out so we could use it with, with drives. And when we had it with SATA drives, it was wonderful. Then Gigabyte, in their uh, infinite wisdom, removed it from the X399 motherboard so it didn't have hot swap, hot plug, which was a bummer. They put it back on the TRX40, and I think it's also in the WRX80. But it's a feature I always look for because we move a lot of drives around, a lot of storage. I'm going to show you that right quick. And this is on page 16 in the Motherboard BIOS manual for SATA configuration, SATA mode. And right there it is. It can be RAID or AHCI, and it supports hot plug. And under the chipset SATA port right here, right here under chipset SATA port hot plug, enable or disable the hot plug capability for each, not collectively, but each. Took long enough to give us that back because when Gigabyte first brought it back, it was collectively, it was globally, everything. Then one thing on everything, I wanted to be able to set that individually like we used to have. Now we're getting it back. So I hope this helps. This has been a slot and lane assignment overview of how it works on this particular Gigabyte Motherboard Extreme. Lots of information. I hope this clarification is insightful. I got one last piece of information I want to share with you right quick as we look at block diagrams. Okay, the block diagram for the Gigabyte X670 or its Extreme, the block diagram for the Gigabyte TRX40 Designare, and the block diagram for the Gigabyte motherboard, the first one they came out with, it had Thunderbolt 3 on it. I just want to give you a quick look as we look at this. PCI Express resources. All this stuff here through the CPU, and it's what we're going to focus on. All this stuff through the CPU is shared except for two M.2 drives. On the TRX40 designator, even though there were PCI Express 4, we have the two M.2 drives that are dedicated, but we also have the two 16-lane slots and the two 8-lane slots, all dedicated. And the other M.2 drives are through the chipset. And moving on quickly, on the WRX80, on the first one from Gigabyte, we've got seven slots. Six of those are 16-lane slots electrically. One of those is an 8-lane slot electrically. And if you notice here, we've got two 10-gigabit Ethernet ports. That's the Intel chipset. That's four lanes. And there's our two M.2 drives to the CPU. And this has uh, a USB-C port to the CPU. And if we were to look at the ASUS WRX80 motherboard, it has 20-gigabit USB-C on that board. I don't remember at the configuration if it's the CPU or what, but it, it's got 20 gigabit. So I wanted to real quickly and briefly share with you a motherboard block diagram to kind of explain how these resources are managed. The difference in shared versus dedicated. You get a lot more, even though you have to pay more, but you have more room to upgrade. Do you want to build a two or three year machine or do you want to build a machine that's got some longevity, even though it's PCI Express 4, where you're looking at uh, dual channel memory versus eight channel memory, where you're looking at uh, 16 cores versus 32 or 64 CPU cores. It's all about resources. So I want to thank you guys for watching. Welcome. My name is Gil Boyd. This is Builder By. We we'll look forward to seeing you next video. And we're out.